Hey, yo, everybody, welcome back. It's Film Tangents. You know what's up? It's what up? What Jake up? here and Edward over there. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's uh, Jake here, Edward over there. Actually, we're uh, we're like thing one and thing two. You never know which one's which. But uh, yeah, or uh, Akbar and Jeff from uh, Matt Greening's Life in Hell comic. It's a little fun, fun little bit of trivia there. Two yeah, two right. two characters. Don't know which one's which. But uh, yeah, just take your best like guess running. at who's who, and uh, yeah. yeah, that's become the running gag this this season. I think last one, I don't remember last one. It, the running gag for me was that I never. I was always like, oh, what's the movie of the week? Did, did I watch it? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> this that's is the right. running gag this season. <laughs> yeah, who's who? But yeah, happy uh, happy late Valentine's Day, everybody. We weren't able to get the uh, the special out last week because uh, Edward was you know just out dicking around. You know, getting wasted, <laughs> trying to, you know, <coughs> just fucking around, man. Not not living up to his, not living up to his full potential. So, uh, you yeah, know, not living up, to, not living up to the the film tangents way of life. Yeah, man. So you know, foregoing his responsibilities and everything. So you know, we're gonna do a little late Valentine's Day special here, but it's but it's all right, everybody. Um, well, we we hope it's all right, anybody. If it's not, uh, you know, I don't know. But anyway, unsubscribe. Yeah, and unsubscribe. unlike the video if you already liked it. Yeah, unsubscribe. Yeah, just and turn off the bell notification. <laughs> it's like do all <laughs> the opposite things of what normally people ask. Subscribe. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you have some time, real quick, I know it's, I know it's a, uh, you know, it's a real easy thing to do. Just scroll on down, hit that subscribe button, hit unsubscribe, and deactivate that bell notification so you never get notified of any of my new videos uh, coming out. I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a uh, happy belated Valentine's Day, everybody. It's still February, so who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to do the Valentine's Day special today because, you know, love is in the air. Um, and uh, we're going to count down our top um, romantic films of all time. Um, but yeah, we're similar to our Halloween special where we counted down our, uh, we did our top 10 horror films. Um, that ended up being quite a bit and we're feeling more of a top five this, this time around. Um, that doesn't mean you'll never get a top 10 again, but you know, we're just, we're just oh, they will, top five. Sure. Yeah. Um, plus I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm like a much bigger horror fan. So I needed to have 10, but I don't feel like I need. Yeah. No, cause that goes with horror. I think, it, I think that's the thing with like you and I had seen so many of those that we could have honestly probably even done like a top 15. Yeah. But this is a more quaint list. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was, it was pretty easy to put this list together. Um, especially considering I just did it. What? Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so uh you're you're starting the countdown then right that's right all right yeah. all right man go for it hey everybody thank you for joining us again um for me um like i said we're gonna do a top five for, for me number five i'm gonna keep it to a classic literary adaptation this is sense and sensibility uh, this is the 1995 specifically the period drama Directed by Ang Lee, the goat, the goat Ang Lee, um, based on Jane Austen's novel from 1811 uh, of the same name. <clears throat> um, Emma Thompson wrote the screenplay and stars Eleanor Dashwood and Kate Winslet, um, who plays Eleanor's uh, younger sister, Marianne. The story of this film, for those who are not aware of how this goes, follows Dash the Dashwood sisters members of a wealthy English family of landed gentry as they must deal with circumstances of sudden destitution as they are forced to seek financial security through marriage um, because of the death of their father. And Hugh Grant and Alan Rickman um, are their, their respective love interests in this film. Um, I wanted to talk about this movie specifically because I, I, this is a movie that I've actually seen for the first time recently. Um, oh, okay. As I was as I was going through watching all the the Jane Austen adaptations, and this film struck me as one of the best like Jane Austen like classic like film adaptations like those movies that that kind of capture this classic feeling of just you know having these open pastures and all this green and you know these people dressed like very properly with yeah. their dresses and the corsets and all this like 
all this um, um, high, like, you know, like high class, like society, like, you know, here, you know, like dramas and minute yeah. interactions. Little you know. women, that type of thing. Exactly. And yeah. to me, this this struck me as like one of the greatest films in that category and specifically when it comes to like tackling like this romantic aspects okay specifically because emma thompson and hugh grant are fantastic like they it the the romance around these two characters it's really captivating and and for those of them that have not seen this i'm trying to keep this kind of spoiler free um and just kind of to invite you guys to to watch these movies if you haven't but the the something that i really appreciate um in film and specifically in films that deal with like you know big emotions like love you know i really appreciate movies like this one that approach it from a a very very kind of subdued and like subtle way um and this is one of those films where you know you have this character in in emma thompson um whom she's just very reserved, you know, very proper, and she just kind of, she she doesn't want to, she's a character that she doesn't want to impose herself, you know, and so she ends up a lot of the time kind of repressing her feelings, and she's the older sister, you know, and then Kate, Kate Winslet's the younger one, and Kate Winslet is just kind of more, you know, they kind of um, contrast each other, where Kate Winslet is just more kind of, um, open and 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 forward with how she feels and what she wants and what she wants to do you know um and she's just kind of more quiet and more specific and she's just kind of you know, like well i want to do this but i don't know if i should or if i shouldn't say anything and you know and and the man's supposed to maybe say something first you know yeah and on the other hand you have hugh grant which kind of parallels and it's it which he kind of mirrors her because he's very similar to her where he just wants to do the right thing. And he's just kind of like stuck between, you know, a knife and a wall where he's just like, oh man, this is what I want to do. But, you know, me wanting to do this might not be the right, you know, thing to do. I have these other things that I, you know, that are quote unquote proper or the right way to go about things. You know, I'm not supposed to, you know, let this person down in order to favor this other person for whom I might have feelings, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's just a very fascinating story. And it's just very, very captivating how these actors, you know, the excellent actors and how they kind of go about portraying these emotions and portraying their love for each other. And at the same time, having this <clears throat> societal pressures for the things that they've, that they've been committed to, you know, so it's, it's, it's very captivating and how all of these things like come to, to, um, a resolution is very cathartic and very moving. Um, just how you, you know, just, just because of the performances, because the performances are so subtle and you're not giving that much away. And when you kind of just see those, those dams like break and everything kind of comes about, it's very gratifying. Yeah. Um, so I wanted my, my, my top five to have one of those like classic, just yes, you know, yep. um, movies. And this is it. Um, again, sense of sensibility. Ang Lee, I was debated between two Ang Lee movies, this one, and another movie that I'll mention in the in and when we do some honorable mentions later on. Um, but this one won out at the end. But Ang Lee is the goat. Is <laughs> the goat. Oh, actually, <laughs> I might mention two Ang Lee movies. This is another one that I, I also thought about putting in here. Um, but yeah, yeah, man. That's that's number five for me. What do you got? Nice, man. Yeah, I definitely don't um I definitely don't go for movies like that with in that setting, like that's always been so I'm just very like, ah, gosh. No, I love them, dude. They're, I, I get all over them. But, you know, you've kind of, yeah, you've definitely kind of sold this one. Um, I definitely need to, I, I, I should, I should add this one to my list here because, you know, if for whatever reason, like, you know, I, I even, even like sub genres of film that I'm really not into, I, I often will, will watch um, because there's still techniques as a writer that you can learn, you know, from these. Um, and it sounds like, you know, with like things that I write that might have like a romance subplot, for instance, it sounds like I could, I could learn a lot from this. So I'll probably yeah. add that to my list, dude. So thanks for the, thanks for the recommendation. Dog. Hey, there you go. Yeah, man. Um, okay. So as I sit here trying to make sure that five is actually what I want to do, 
<laughs> I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Um, I would say, oh, fuck. I'm, it's like between these two. It's like, fuck, man. Um, yeah, I would say. Let me think. Yeah, fuck it. Uh, number five is Ghost with Patrick Swayze. Ghost, oh, with Patrick Swayze. Yeah, man. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, about time with Rachel McAdams. It's like between those yeah, that's two. That's a great movie. I know. About time that's is great, great. And, and I don't know. Maybe, maybe ah, fuck. It's tough. But I've already said Ghost. So, uh, but you know, for what it's worth, about time is obviously an honorable mention. And and just know that until about. Five seconds ago, about time was listed as number five, and then I drew a big red X over it and put ghost. So make of that what you will. But yeah, man. Um, yeah, number five would be Ghost with Patrick Swayze. I just think it's a it's a great concept. Um, I've seen this movie a number of times. Kind of doubles as like you know, it, it's not really a horror movie, but there is like horror. There are horror elements there, and. Um, you know, it, it obviously, as the title would suggest, there's, uh, you know, a lot of supernatural elements to this movie. Um, but basically, the the plot goes, uh, Sam Wheat, played by Patrick Swayze, is a banker. Uh, Molly Jensen, Demi Moore, is an artist, and the two are madly in love. Uh, however, when Sam is murdered by friend and corrupt business partner Carl Brunner, Bruner, over a shady business deal, he is left to roam the earth as a powerless spirit. Uh, when he learns of Carl's betrayal, Sam must seek the help of psychic Oda Mae Brown, played by Whoopi Goldberg, to set things right and protect Molly from Carl and his goons. Um, so yeah, like Ghost, honestly, it, it's one of those movies where the the love story really drives the, um, you know, it's it's no pun intended, like the heart of the movie, and it really drives mm. the the plot of the film. You haven't seen Ghost, right? No, I have not. Yeah, go, it, it's great. I think it's pretty underrated, actually. Um, you know, it gets a little melodramatic in, in spots, but uh, I over, overall, I think it's it's a f- fantastic movie. It's very devastating, like very devastating, especially, when, uh, you know, seeing it when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, just a really devastating movie, man. Like when he first, um, when he, you know, obviously no spoilers, it's in, it's in the... Um, description there but when patrick swayze's character dies you know he dies in like this in a very sudden way and you're kind of hit with both two realizations one i'm fucking dead and two i can't be with you know the person i'm in love with anymore and Mm. just that the way they use sort of the supernatural angle to give you that feeling of sort of longing and like put up that wall, that literal barrier, i.e. life and death barrier of life, the barrier between life and death uh, between two people who are in love with each other. Um, it's, it's very powerful. Uh, and I think it works really, really well for the most part. And I think it's a great movie. And, and like I said, I think it's pretty underrated. I don't, you never really hear it talked about. Um, and I think that's a shame cause I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Yeah. But that's, um, yeah. Ghost. That's my number five, man. All right, dude. Well, for me, um, moving into top four territory, <clears throat> I wanted to do for my fourth film, I wanted to do, I guess like my favorite, um, romantic comedy movie of yeah. all time. <laughs> okay. Um, and so for me, my favorite romantic movie, my favorite romantic comedy movie of all time is um, Punch Drunk Love. Dude, we had the same Adam number said- four. <laughs> 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 we might as well. So we might as well just open up the, the yeah. open up the lines here of yeah. conversation. So, but you go first. Uh, yeah. OK. But I mean, classic movie at this point, 2002, Paul Thomas Anderson, <clears throat> Adam Sandler. Emma Watson, it's um, it's it's to me the the definition of of just kind of having this this very I guess like artistic approach to to both comedy and then romance at the same time because the movie is very unorthodox as you know from both its presentation yeah. to the you know the, the film like um, 
language the film has itself, and then its use of Adam Sandler. Um, and it's interesting because I I've I've grown up loving Adam Sandler. Um, there's a lot of Same there's here. a handful of of comedic actors, um, and I'm not going to go too much into in depth of comedic actors because I think one of I think you might have another comedic actor <laughs> maybe make an appearance in your list. I'm guessing, um, but Sandler's one of them. Loved Sandler my my whole life. I've loved Sandler um, from movies like I mean Happy Gilmore was I think one of my first introductions to, to him. Billy Madison. Yeah. Um, so I've always loved like his way of his humor. I've always loved his facial expressions. <laughs> yeah. You know. His I always loved to anger. I, sorry to cut you off. I always loved yeah. anger management when I was younger. Yeah. Like, and that you, was and my you introduced favorite. me to that movie. Yeah. Like you introduced me to that movie at length. I had seen like the first ten minutes of that movie, but I've never seen like the whole thing. Yeah. Um. And and he always makes me laugh. You know, the guy always makes me laugh. What he does, like his his physical comedy. So when I learned, you know, back in 2015, when I was, you know, getting more more going more in depth into Paul Thomas Anderson and his filmography, and I wa- and I learned that he had a you know he had an Adam, Adam Sandler movie. I was like, well, this is sticking out like a sore thumb against you know that there would be bloods and the masters. Like this is really you know just coming out of nowhere, um, and so I remember watching that movie and just kind of being floored with how much I was laughing, and with just the thematic ideas around romance and around love and around partnership. But I'm going to pass it to you since you have the same one as I do. Yeah. No, I mean, and maybe I'll go. I'll go into detail a little bit more after after I hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, um, definitely like ditto to everything you just said, and I mean. Uh, yeah, like it, it, it has. It's kind of like how do we do sort of a Billy Madison type movie, but um, also bring in, um, you know, kind of a, 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 like you said, an artistic sensibility to it, like a more more of an artistic sensibility to it. It's like if they, you know, it's like Paul Thomas Anderson kind of said, which you know maybe this is what he kind of set out to do. But it's like Tom, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson said, "Let's take uh, Billy. We're going to take Billy Madison and direct it as if, you know, like David Lynch <laughs> wanted to direct it, yeah. or, Kubrick, or Kubrick maybe, yeah. or so. You know, Kubrick might be taking it a little far, but um, yeah, it's like let's let's do that, but bring a very sort of surreal, uh, an even more surreal and and sort of ethereal uh, aspect to it." Um, yeah. And, and it's like, it's just done really well. Cause it's like the same kind of thing. You know, if you follow that plot, it's, it's a very similar plot when you really think about it. It's like this total fucking weirdo who's got some serious kind of, you know, um, uh, who, who's very unhinged, let's say who, you know, sort of finds an unlikely partner, you know, mm-hmm. and, and is sort of like, you know, dating up in a way. And and just these very machismo <laughs> villains. I mean, it's really kind of the same yeah. sort of formula that you see in those yeah. in those Happy Madison <laughs> productions yeah. movies. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But they take it, and again, they just add this this um, avant garde layer to it. I would say, uh, I think that's probably the right word for it. Av- this avant garde yeah. layer. Yeah. And uh, yet, yeah, dude, I can't. I dude. Every time I talk about this movie, I can't not hear that freaking Popeye song in my head after. <laughs> like, isn't it from Popeye? <laughs> the like Which one? Yeah, the 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 like the love song that I think it's sung Oh, by... because she loves me. Loves yeah, me. yeah, that one. Isn't that from Popeye yeah, it, it, or it something? Is, it is from Popeye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like but yeah, um I can't not dude, that plays like on loop as I'm talking about this movie. Um yeah, and then uh, what else? What else is there to say? It's hard to say more than that. That's really it. When you think about it, it's it's sort of again, it, it's sort of a great example of an X meets Y type idea. That is to say, mm-hmm. some of my favorite ideas are it's this meets that. You know, it's right, like it's right. it's whatever. You know, like what the novel I'm writing right now. I tell people it's. Hellraiser meets Dune, you know, <laughs> or like, or if they're, you know, or, or some, you know, depending on how I'm feeling, I'll be like, it's Hellraiser meets Game of Thrones. You know, I like this meets that 
type ideas because I love mm-hmm. inspiration. I'm a very like, Tarantino type writer, mm-hmm. I think, where I just love stealing shit and putting it in a blender and blending it up. And mm-hmm. I think that this, I think Punch Drunk Love is a great example of that, where it's like, hey, it's Billy Madison meets, what would you say it meets? I, I can't, for some reason, I'm blanking on that. Mm. It, like, it just feels... It, Billy it, Madison, like it's, uh, who, who the fuck's calling me? Hang on, let me end this. <laughs> Go ahead. No, it just feels like one of those things where, like you said, it feels like Billy Madison, it really just feels like a, like a, Adam Sandler movie crashing just into into um there's some specific movies it's a Robert Altman movie I forget what the name of it is um but it feels like that crashing into that it's like clashing into just like an unorthodox like romantic movie you yeah know? you could even say um, like a, a little a later out of the box yeah, yeah. So go ahead. sorry I, yeah I didn't mean to cut you off I, I think it, it you could even talk about like Phantom Thread, which is a later Paul Thomas Anderson movie. You could just say it's mm-hmm. Billy Madison meets Phantom Thread, which is again yeah, ironic absolutely. because yeah. that's what Paul Thomas Anderson eventually went on to make. But mm-hmm. yeah, like that's probably my best comparison. It's Billy Madison meets Phantom Thread. I think if you put if you put those two things in a blender, you'd get something like Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, <clears throat> just very and the, the- very Kubrickian kind of Lynchian style of directing it, 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 that skin around an Adam Sandler comedy. Yeah. And the, and the thing that I wanted to touch on was like something that always fascinates me. And it's kind of something that, that runs through Paul Thomas Anderson's films all together is the, the themes around the, the themes around companionship or about this, not even companionship, but like predetermination and that's something that I always find fascinating with his movies. Yeah. Because when you watch Punch Drunk Love, you know, and then you rewatch Punch Drunk Love, you realize that it's like there's a lot of hints in that movie to to being like, oh, there's a person because he color codes the characters. So he's blue and she's pink, you know, and then you see like all the pink in the movie and you see that there's scenes where there's a person walking in the background who's wearing pink, you know, and it feels like these characters like collided into each other and like that was just like an inevitability you know like this yeah. like collision you know and i love excuse me i love his use of vehicles there's a lot of scenes in this movie where like cars just like pass by really fast you know like or they crash into shit <laughs> exactly or they crash into stuff and they, there's that car that comes like just crashing by at the beginning of the film and i feel like that's like a i feel like that's like a big thematic statement to just kind of being like these people were in a collision course you know and it it happened, you know. Excuse me. And um, and to, I'm always fascinated by that, you know, yeah. by by those ideas of just kind of being like, you know, these these people. This is this was this was meant <laughs> to happen. Yeah. Um, and it's just very fun, you know. And then just watching how it goes about, and then watching Barry, who's a very awkward guy, you yeah. know, just navigate his awkwardness and and um adjust you know and and become a better person you know because ultimately it, he becomes a better person he's almost like an anime protagonist <laughs> in this movie where yeah. it's like it's like the power of love and friendship like you know makes him like a stronger like better guy he says that <laughs> in the movie <laughs> yeah um, and obviously philip Seymour hoffman's in this movie and any movie that that guy Mattress was ever man. in yeah, he just makes he just makes it a thousand times better. Oh, 100%. Um, so so yeah. true. And and yeah, and this movie has, you know, gifted us with pretty much a a, a quote that we say every single time we hang out pretty much. What's usually <laughs> usually by the end of the hangout when one of us is going home or when we're yeah. parting ways, that's that mattress man. That's that that's that mattress man. <laughs> That, that quote's lived with us for a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> That's a classic right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, great, great number four pick, Edward. Great number four, like likewise, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, so I think it's you, your turn I, again. Yeah, I'll pick it up here. Um, so for me, <clears throat> number three, I wanted number three to be a movie um, that – was I guess like my favorite supernatural romantic film. Um, in this instance, I chose 
to go with Only Lovers Left Alive by Jim Jarmusch. Another, another different movie of his, I forget what it is, it's a movie starring Adam Driver that I know people love a lot, it's another romantic film, but I haven't seen it, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I have seen Only Lovers Left Alive, and this is a movie about vampi- vampires. Um, and vampires are just one of those like um, supernatural being creatures that I've always been fascinated with. I've had a relationship with these things. I've watched, at some point I watched like as many vampire movies as I ever could. And this is one of them yeah. for my, my research purposes. And this is one of the great ones. This is like one yeah, of the all time. You've written a vampire uh, Yeah, that's right. I've written a vampire short film. Yeah. And this is one of the great um, vampire romantic films for those out there. For those out there that, that think that Warm Bodies is where it's at. This is where it's at. Um, you've seen, you've seen warm bodies. I've seen warm bodies. I don't think, yeah, I didn't think it was that good. No, but as you, as, as it would go, um, this is a movie that literally goes by the name. Um, this is about Tom Hiddleston and Tilda Swinton. And they are amongst, I think they are amongst, if not the only like living vampires left and they are together. So they're in a relationship and it's fascinating with them. Um, because you were, no, they're not the only ones left. There's a couple other ones, but it's fascinating with this film because you, you understand their relationship so well, like how much depth <laughs> their relationship has, like, they're, you know, because it's like these people have been together for eons, you know, but because of that, you, you get to a grasp of like the, the amount of depth of the relationship, the amount of care that they have for each other, despite the amount of time that has passed. Um, and there's some really funny stuff in this movie because specifically Tom Hiddleston gets really depressed. Like whenever she's not around, he gets like really depressed. It's like a it's like a scene where I think he like he like puts like a bullet in a gun and he's like just like really sad and he's like calling her and be like, when are you gonna come by? You know? <laughs> um so they have a very fascinating dynamic. Um and I, I relate to the characters, you know, and, and to to the way that they interact with each other and the way that they approach each other and also the themes of the movie because it, it, it expands beyond the idea of them being like amongst the only vampires left alive and it also touches in the themes of being like the only kind of people you know yeah. like the only people that that let's say like have an idea about the world or an idea about how you should carry yourself or an idea about how you should interact with each other, an idea about love um, specifically um, is ultimately what the movie is trying to convey. You know, that these people have um, almost like a very classic, you know, way of romanticism, you know, Um, the same reason why I love reading stuff like One Piece, you know, Um, just like, you know, just the, the idea that people can have like a very, um pure in a very um kind of wholesome in a way way of 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 interacting with the world and thinking about the world as as being like a a a place where you can you can exercise like romanticism and be romantic you know interesting um so very fascinating movie it's not for those who don't who who despise slow pace it's a very slow paced movie and it just takes its time. The scenes are very long. And, you know, it, it ultimately, ultimately, it's entirely about the themes and entirely about the characters, the way they interact with each other and their actions. Um, there's no big action sequences. You know, it's ultimately just watching people interact. Um, almost like a weird, grungy vampire hangout movie in a way. Um but yeah, I, I love this movie. Like I said, Jim Jarmusch directed it. BBC shows it as one of the 100 greatest movies of the 21st century. Um, it's from 2013, fantasy, comedy, romance, drama, film. Um, and I think it's great. Mia Wasikowska, she's also in this movie. Um, I think it's great. It's great. I really recommend it. It's my top three um, film. And there it goes. Nice. Never heard of that one. Check that one mm. out. I told you, dude, I told you I'd be full of surprises. Yeah, man. <laughs> Except uh, for Contra, man. And my number one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know what those I know what that is. Um Okay. So yeah, my number three. Coming in at number three. We're the top three, folks. Three top three out of five. So not a huge deal, but 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 a huge deal. Um my number three is uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's quite a surprise. Yeah. 
Uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah, just just an incredible film. Uh, I give that I gave that movie a ten out of ten. Uh, first time I watched it, actually. Well, I, I've yeah. only seen it once, but I already know that it's you know I I can't I can't leave it off this list. Um, that movie had yeah quite uh, quite an impact on me. Quite a powerful film. Like I said, I've only seen it once, so there's it is not a very powerful movie. I think I've seen it a couple of times. Yeah, I've only seen it once, and I saw it for the first time like maybe two years ago or so. Um, and I don't, you know, I I don't um actually remember like that much about it. I remember the basics of it, but mm. uh, again, it just it made such an impact on me. I just knew I, I couldn't leave it off of this list. Yeah, um, I remember that. I I remember that movie a little bit too. It's it's one of those movies that like the, that. I remember that the thing that I took from that movie was that it was it, it like like Punch Drunk Love. It was almost like predetermination, wasn't it? You know, yeah, with these two kids. Exactly. Yeah. Just very powerful. Um, yeah. So just kind of the synopsis for people listening. Basically, as eighteen-year-old uh, Jamal Malik answers questions on the Indian version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, flashbacks show how he got there. Part of a stable of young thieves after their mother dies, Jamal and his brother Salim survive on the streets of Mumbai. Uh, Salim finds the life of crime agreeable, but Jamal scrapes by with small jobs until landing a spot on the game show. Mm. Um, yeah. Like Edward said too, it's, it's very powerful with those themes of pre, uh, predetermination, predestination. Um, yeah, just phenomenal film. Really all I have to say about it, but, um, yeah, it, it, and there's a big, there's a big dance sequence. (laughs) There's a what? There's a big dance sequence. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it, it, it just, it, it blew me away the first time I saw it. And, and I've, I've really, you know, that there's, it's one of those movies where I watch it and, and I was so invested in it and just hanging on every second of that movie, like just hanging on every second, hanging on every line of dialogue, just on the edge of my seat, you know? And like, you just sit there and you're like, man, if only I could be this invested, like in any, in every story. And if Mm -hmm. only, uh, one day I, I will be able to create a story that in turn, uh, people are this invested in, you know, cause that's the goal of mm-hmm. any writer. Um, but yeah, that's my number three. All right, dude. Great movie. Great movie. Okay. This is tough two territory, everybody. Um, my number two is an animated movie so this is as you can see i've I've done little themes it's like okay this is like my my favorite romantic animated film all right um and that is a movie called whisper of the heart one of my favorite movies ever um this was directed by let me see give me a second this was directed by mr yoshifumi kondo um, this is a movie from 1995. Again, animated romantic drama film. Um, oh, Studio Ghibli, huh? Studio Ghibli, that's right. So this is, like I said, this is directed by Yoshifumi Kondo under Studio Ghibli. Um, it was written and it was it was written by Hayao Miyazaki, but it was directed by by Kondo. Kondo is an insanely, insanely gifted filmmaker insanely gifted like this is one of the best like in terms of like direction visual presentation of the animations like understanding of 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 beats and when to pull in and when to push out and 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 just kind of portraying this emotions in an animated medium you know this is in 1995 like It's weird with Ghibli because I feel like people have I feel like people disrespect Ghibli because a lot of the a lot of the conversations that I see these days are about how you know the Spider Verse movies are like pushing animation and the greatest animation and this and that and the other thing and I'm like man who cares man yeah like who like who cares that they're animating that they're animating those movies at like a thousand frames per second it doesn't matter you know like you know you know that I'm not a big fan of the second Spider Man movie anyway but yeah me neither. my point is that it's like a lot of the time it's like for me a lot of the time it's not how like well animated a animated movie is or like how many frames are moving and how everything is moving and the changing colors to me a lot of the time it's just about feeling you know 
and just like basic being able to accurately just capture the emotions, you know. Um, and this is one of those movies that does that immaculately. Yeah. Um, I, I always feel bad when I think about this movie because the director for this movie, Mr. Kondo, he passed away. He made this movie and he passed away. So this is this was his one contribution. Um, he got the chance to step up. Nobody had ever gotten the chance at Ghibli to step up and direct a movie. Like the only people directing movies were Miyazaki and, and Hayao Takahata. They were the only ones, you know. Um, and Kondo, he was Kondo was literally like the the way that Miyazaki and the way that Takahata and the way that Yo Hisashi and all those guys at Ghibli, the way that they talked about him, he was a prodigy, you know. And they were like, you know, they were like, we're gonna stop this duopoly of of just Miyazaki and and Takahata and let's give Kondo his shot, you know, let's have him make a movie, and he did, and it was fantastic. I mean, to this day, I think this stands as like one of the greatest movies Ghibli ever made. Um, but enough said about Kondo and all the BS. Um, this is a romantic film, um, and it's about Shizuku. This is our t- this is about teenager, like teenage characters. Um, they're in junior high school. Um, in Japan, high school goes until the ninth grade, and then 10, 11, and twelve. That's like high school. Um, so they're they're so ninth middle grade, school right? goes through ninth grade. You said exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so they they call it junior high school, and that's what it is. And it's about her. Um, and she lives in Tokyo with her parents and her older sister, and she is very keen on creative writing, so she wants to be a writer. Um, and one evening, she looks through the, the checkout cards at, a li- like a, at the library books where she, the town where she lives, and she discovers that every single book that she checks out, before she checks it out, they were previously checked out by a, by a Seiji Masawa. And she just becomes intrigued in finding this guy out. Who is this guy? What's oh, going on? Oh, Seiji, you, know? you um, dog, man. Yeah, and, and also, you know, because he, he always, you know, they have, like, in their library in the film, they have, like, a, every book has, like, a little card saying, like, who had it, and he had it every time before she did. So she becomes kind of intrigued by him. Who is this person? There's a little bit of magical realism in this film um, where the characters also kind of inhabit in their thoughts and in their dreams this, like, magical world or this, like, a, there's, like, cats and, and these, you know, there's, like, magic and you can fly and there's cats and there's all this stuff. Um, and there's like a cat specifically in the film that's kind of like a magical cat. So there's a little bit of that in the movie. Um, and this movie actually like has a spin-off film called The Cat Returns. Um, and it specifically follows like the cats that feature in the magical realism elements of this film. Um, but ultimately, this is a movie about finding like, again, like finding like the person that's that's there for you, you know, and then yeah. growing together with that person. Cause she finds Seiji. I'm not going to go too much into details, but all, this happens in the first act, <laughs> you know, she says she <laughs> finds Seiji and, and she realizes that, you know, she um, loves writing and she's gifted. She's a gift writer and she wants to pursue that. And then for Seiji, he loves music and he works at, I think it's like his uncle or his grandfather's shop where he makes like cellos, like he makes instruments and he's also a very gifted player. So they understand that they're both people who have like these pursuits. They grow together, they help each other out. Um, and then, you know, romantic stuff happens. <laughs> yeah. But again, in terms of like animated films and in terms of like Ghibli films, I think this is one of the best movies they've ever made. They've ever made. Um, yeah, I love this movie. I cannot recommend it enough. And if you watch this movie, maybe buy it. So people will be like, oh, man, this Kondo guy was great. And maybe he really gives more shots to other people and not just Miyazaki. Um, or that one other guy, because there's another guy making movies in there, too. Miyazaki's son. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, that's my number two, man. What's you got? Yeah, it sounds really good. I, um, I just put that on my watch list, actually. It sounds fantastic. Um, you know, it's funny. I, while I was, I was looking the film up while you were talking about it, and uh, mm-hmm. this, is, this looks like... Um, this movie is where the 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 still photo that people always put on the lo-fi beats to study to. Yeah, is. no, it is. That's where it comes from. This is where the movie. This is where they come from. So whenever funny, I'm like man. listening to the like at work or whatever, if I'm doing something, I that's I always remember that this day comes from this movie. That's so funny. I like the yeah. little cats too, man. They look cool. Yeah, the cats are dope. Yeah, mm-hmm. I like the the magical realism aspect of it. Seems really cool too. But y'all have to check this one out. Uh, never actually never heard of that one so. Yeah, it has flair to the film because otherwise the film is very much like 
unlike other Ghibli movies, you know, like Totoro and stuff like that, it's very much down to earth. Yeah. Yeah, I got. I have to catch up on a lot of Ghibli movies. Like, I haven't really seen that many. I've seen Spirited Away, yeah. Howl's Moving Castle, um, but I haven't seen My Neighbor Totoro. Uh, I need to see Princess Mononoke. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've seen you've seen, seen the you've now. seen the like the big standout ones. Yeah. There, there's there's there there are um there's there's some there's some poopy ones. Yeah. <laughs> Not all of them are great. <laughs> <laughs> some stinkers. All right. Yeah, there's some stinkers. So my number two uh is gonna be before midnight. Um, wow. Yeah. So we had to, yeah. So basically, you know, we, we were, um, talking about making these lists. Right. And when we decided to do a top five, I said, well, you know, I can't really do the whole before trilogy. I could do the before mm-hmm. trilogy. If it were a top 10, I could put them all in there, but if it's only a top five, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to settle with my favorite of the trilogy. Yeah, it can't be like a three, four, three, two. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three. Yeah. What? Well, yeah. More than half of this list is uh, one movie series. No. Um, so I had, I, but I thought it'd make it interesting because it, it's, you know, it, it's, you gotta, you gotta be more, you gotta, you gotta figure out which one's your favorite. And yeah. uh, my favorite has to be before midnight. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, So, you know, it's kind of hard to, I I mean, basically um, for those listening, it's like there's three movies before um, sunrise, before sunset and before midnight. Each Mm -hmm. of them take place 12 years apart, something like that. 11? Nine years. Oh, okay. Nine years apart. And basically the first movie, our main character played by Ethan Hawke, uh, meets a woman on a train. That movie is, you know, just about kind of the beginnings of their relationship. Uh, the middle, the second movie is, you know, them sort of reuniting nine years later. Um, because it was, you know, in the first movie, it's like they're kind of meant for each other, but there's also this big distance kind of problem. Um, mm-hmm. And then in the third movie, um, basically, mm-hmm. you know, they're, um, they're, they're, married finally um the third movie i think is my favorite you know they they all work really together consecutively they all work as a unit you know what i mean like all three of them work together really well as a unit where it's like you kind of i don't i wouldn't it's like even though before midnight's my favorite i don't want that movie without the other two although each of them work Mm -hmm. on their own too you know, it, that's kind of the crazy thing is you could pluck one of these out and have it be a standalone film and it would work, you know, whether it's the first, obviously the first one would, the second one would, and the third one would, they they would all work on their own, I think. Um, and Before Midnight is very interesting because it's sort of this, I, I really think, so like the first movie plays into the sort of young love naivete aspect the honeymoon aspect uh, Mm -hmm. of it um the second one kind of deals with like the second chances sort of thing of like hey we really were meant uh to be together and you know Mm -hmm. it's kind of this idea of like hey we shouldn't you shouldn't just ignore that honeymoon phase we really had something and we should have made it work the Mm -hmm. third one is sort of the the very mature uh, realization of hey love is is work you know and mm-hmm. it's sort of a movie that you watch and you really realize because the, you know it's like the characters they're in a marriage and they really love each other but there's just a lot of complications you know the the main character mm-hmm. has a kid from previous marriage um mm-hmm. you know he's he's obsessed with his work you know um his wife you know, she loves being a mother, but she also feels like, hey, you know, I have other aspirations as well. And mm-hmm. it it's very much this realization of love is hard work and there's more to a relationship than just two people loving each other. Like, it's not enough. That's mm-hmm. kind of what I get from that movie is like love doesn't is a piece of the whole 
you know, it's a big, it's a big piece of the mm-hmm. larger whole, but it's not everything. Right. There are other things that are separate from the love they have for each other that um, are influencing this relationship and really kind of tarnishing it. And it's just very it's a very sobering film. Um, And what I one of my favorite things is at the beginning of the first movie, when these two characters are in their honeymoon phase, the way that they meet is that the main character played by Ethan Hawke gets up and moves seats because he's irritated at an older couple fighting near him. Right. And that to me was the most brilliant, like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like poetry. It rhymes. It's like, that was the (laughs) most brilliant. That's like actually done right. Where that was Mm -hmm. the most brilliant kind of full circle thing of, Mm -hmm. Oh shit. And before midnight, they're they're now the old couple fighting. It's just kind of, and I don't think the the before midnight movie because I remember watching that with, um, with this with this girl, um, and her kind of saying like, oh, I didn't like that because it's like really, you know, um, you know, nihilistic and it feels like uh, cynical, and mm-hmm. I don't think the movie is saying that this is the fate of every couple. I think that's no. the wrong message to get from that movie. That's kind of like that whole red pill thing that I think is bullshit. But mm-hmm. it's it's sort of a reality of like you can't you have to be aware of these things that are chipping away insidiously right. day by it's, day it's, that right. that are going thing. yeah that are going to tarnish your relationship regardless of how much you love each other. It's going to have an effect. And I think that's sort of what is really being said in that movie. And, you know, when you watch that movie, like, I think that, you know, it it ultimately has sort of a positive outlook of like, hey, like love can triumph over all of these sort of, quote unquote, earthly complications, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, But yeah, anything you want to say about that movie? No, I agree with you um, 100%. I think I think it's one of those things, like you said, um, where with this film, I think this film is a very like I think this film is like a very healthy film. Yeah. In the sense that it's not, um, I disagree with the idea of this film being cynical. You know, because I think I think it's the opposite. I think it's just kind of trying to give people hope. And I don't think you. I think you don't give people hope through idealism. I think you give people hope through, through you know, drama and just kind of showing yeah. people like, you know, you can overcome these things and these characters, despite you know, the the surmounting you know amount of like, um, um, like you said, just like things kind of chipping at them or negativity or you know this and that and the other thing. It's like ultimately. You know, if you are willing to put in the work, you know, you can, you can, you can surpass these things. Exactly. You, know, you can kind of go, you can, you can get past them. And it's fascinating because I know people were clamoring for there to be like a fourth film. And it's like, why, why even, you no, know, like, I feel like this is an trilogy. Yeah. What, what are they going to be trilogy, like people, because... old people, like, you know, it's like, this was, right. this was like, the final kind of yeah. stage like, of, I feel, of a relationship. I feel like what, I feel like what would be like a cool thing to do for Link Ladder, like the director of this film would be for him to make a movie in which like maybe these characters have like a cameo or they're in the background and it is Ethan Hawke and her and you're like oh there they are you know because it's like at this point in time you've I feel like you've exhausted the thematic idea you know here at hand with this last film like you said showcasing like you know like nothing's perfect in the world and you know the number one thing is that you're willing to put in the work and that you have these feelings and you're able and you know and you're willing and able to hold on to them you know um so yeah i think it's a very i think it is like a i think it ultimately is like a very um positive movie um yeah i agree and just to clarify like yeah i don't think the movie's cynical either um that's what, yeah no i know i know just, okay, said, just said that, sure. that person said that yeah, yeah the person i watched the, i'm arguing i'm arguing against that yeah like that person's mindset you know from all those years ago exactly um yeah so no, I, I agree. And like like the other movies, um the dialogue is riveting. It's another ten. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't get better than this yeah. movie. And the, the fight that they have 
the the argument yeah. that they have and the way it sort of yeah. there's peaks and valleys in their argument and how the argument will kind of stop and they'll they'll start talking normally again and then it ramps up again so realistic mm-hmm. as someone who yeah, has had yeah. <laughs> girlfriends where we've yeah. argued and who's yeah. heard other couples argue spot yeah. on like spot so on. fucking realistic it's yeah. exactly how it goes where it's like there's a ramping up but there's a big argument and then it sort of like dies down you know and it's like yeah you know i guess uh i guess i just feel this way oh yeah no i feel that way and then one person says yeah. like one wrong thing in there that it's just like here we go yeah and it's like oh that's how you feel that it just bruh, yeah. starts up again it's like, <laughs> so, so good yeah. But yeah, that's my favorite of the before trilogy because of everything you just said. It's like it's a very, um, you know, sobering yet hopeful film of like, hey, listen, Absolutely. like love isn't all uh, sunshine and roses, but it can triumph if you really love each other. and If the person is really worth it, you mm-hmm. may be able, may not will, but may be able to overcome certain right. obstacles because it's just the, the reality you know, there are there are uh, there is children from other marriages finances right. where we want to live work. you know mm. work yeah exactly mm. jealousy it, there's so many things so many things can change yeah. and and i mean i think what is it like in some crazy number 70 percent something crazy it's like in, of divorces it's like money is cited as a primary factor or something like that mm-hmm. i forget what the statistic is at least half i think mm-hmm. but uh yeah i think you were about to say something else about it uh i forgot okay <laughs> uh so that's that's under your number one then right hey oh do you, shit do you want to guess it you want to guess what it is yeah it's uh before uh it's before sunset yeah, it's before sunset. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a, I'll take a guess at your number one. Yeah, yeah, you, okay. You, I'm, you I'm excited up. for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's my number one. Um, Richard Linklater, 2004, hour and ten minutes. It is, in my opinion, not even just like a like a perfect romantic film. It's like it's a perfect movie. Yeah. It's a perfect movie. It's a, it's perfect. Um, it it you because you. You you watch before sunrise, and before sunrise, you could argue that it's like the perfect idealistic like film, like the perfect just like idealism of romance. You know, um, you could say that about that film. And then you and and that movie almost I almost chose that movie as my number one just because of that, because it just feels that way. You know, um, very youthful, just like idea of romance. Um, but I chose before um, sunset. Um, because it's the movie of those three films that have had the the biggest impact on me personally. Um, because I think it's the movie that it's like the most in touch with what I could only describe as just just you know like the the soul of the characters, like this human soul of the characters. Um, and I feel like it's the least. It's I feel like it, of those three movies, I feel like it's the one that's the least. Um, the least I would say preoccupied with with um finality or the least preoccupied with like ideas. It's like the one of those movies that's like the most just kind of like this is the moment, you know, and let's just kind of unveil these people, you know, ten years, nine, ten years later and then and then just see like, you know, what happens. Um, it's the hardest one and, to pigeonhole too. If I could just yeah. throw this in real quick, because like as I'm kind of talking about the phases of love that they were each going into, I was finding it hard. If you noticed uh, when I was talking about the second one, it was hard for me to kind of put that one into a category. It's like what mm-hmm. phase of love is that one? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like very, it's yeah. very unique. You know, yeah. So it's it's fascinating with this film and and this film, you know, all these movies are all about them being at a location. This like a movie they're in France, and and then just walking around. You know, they walk around and they talk. You know, and they and they kind of just take a little bit from each other and 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 just kind of go more in depth and more in depth and more in depth. You know, and 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 it's a fascinating movie because again, in retrospect, from the first one, they're 
older and they're aged, you know, and they kind of talk about each other and the wrinkles and how Ethan Hawke has, you know, like a, like a wrinkly forehead, yeah. you know, and they, you know, so they have these conversations, but it's also like a very, this movie also like, this movie is like very like much obsessed with the idea, I feel like of, of, um, partnership and, and and romanticism in a way that the first movie the first movie was like more so obsessed with romance overall and then the first movie just ends up being an existential film in the end because they end up being separated um and this movie is not an existential film um or it doesn't fit within existentialism it doesn't check out it doesn't check all the boxes um but this is a fascinating movie just because it, it explores these two characters and it explores basically like what would happen to the soul of these two people, you know, to like their essence, if they recognize that they had found the person they were looking for in each other, you know, in their early 20s, and that then they, because of circumstances, were separated. Another meeting, again, nine, 10 years later. And it's just basically seeing what happens to you when that happens to you, you know? It's literally just, it's literally, that's the best way I can describe it. It's just seeing what happens to a human being, especially like sensitive human beings. Like these are two very sensitive people. And we kind of get that through the film, like that they're, you know, they're very much in touch, in touch with their emotions and they're very sensible, you know? Um, and then just seeing what happens to these people, you know, the, again, two very romantic characters and, and then just kind of seeing how weathered they are from the life that they fled by having to be separated from each other for 10 years, you know. And it's like how this guy has aged, you know. And now he has a kid and he's like very unhappy, you know. Yeah. And how, you know, and how this woman has just kind of focused on 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 professional pursuits while basically feeling like there's nothing to give to anybody, you know feeling like I had found the right person at one point in my life. And then everything since then has just kind of been this like very shallow imitation of that emotion, you know? So it was just, it was just very fascinating. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Philosophically, yeah. you know, that film. And like you said, it's very difficult to pigeonhole that film because it's just really just kind of, you know, examining these two characters and just we're just staying with them and just watching them open up to each other again and being being willing to be vulnerable which seemingly they have not been able to do that for 10 years with anybody you know yeah um and it's devastating you know you watch this movie and it's devastating just the very the 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 minute you know touches the minute moments of like trying to reach for somebody you know like all those small things i always think about those things that we stay with you so there's a movie that's been a very big impact on me i think about this movie all the time um and then it's also a perfect movie in the sense that it's an hour and 10 minutes uh, yeah. <laughs> and then you know you just see them in her room and you're like what's gonna happen what's gonna happen perfect and the movie ending. ends beautiful you know ending. and then you're like oh my god you know what's gonna happen and in that sense you know it feels like essential because you don't know what's gonna happen you just you're left wondering like did he catch the plane? Did he not? What what happened? Clearly, these people are meant to be together, but they have all these outside world things, you know, pushing them or pulling them. Um, again, to me, perfect movie. Um, yeah, it's the, it's, the, it's the before movie that I love the most. I think all three of them are perfect films, honestly, but this one, to me, has always been like the most personal one of them for me. Yeah. I would say that this one too is is. I would say this one it might be, in a way, the least about love and more about kind of regrets too. Yeah, and and just time, you know, and, and time and sort of the idea of paths in life. This movie's I, I now that as you were talking about it, I realized how similar, how much. Um, the movie Past Lives owes to this movie very similar mm -hmm. in turn in terms of like okay so that's we it, both kind of took separate roads. This is a great movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you'll love that. I movie. know. I've, I've I've I have it on my watch list. Yeah. Um, but it's like you know, kind of that idea of uh, you know, hey, like our roads, our paths split, you know, and now they've intertwined once again, and it's sort of like, oh, okay, yeah, what have you been up to, <laughs> kind of yeah. that kind yeah. of thing, and and it's like, yeah. oh, uh, well, yeah, we totally should have. <laughs> stuck it out you know or, or, or how would it have been uh if if we had stayed together 
Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that concept. Just the I, that's one of the reasons I think like the uh, series finale of Better Call Saul is, is just an unbelievable masterpiece because it's about mm-hmm. that. It's a, the theme exactly. of that episode. Yeah. That's also that's also why I love that 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 it's also why I have so much appreciation for that too. Yeah, because that final episode of Better Call Saul, it's like you know they keep there's the time machine motif and it's all about regrets mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. you know, what ifs yeah, yeah. and i just i love that concept especially as a young person who maybe it, it'll become a more painful concept <laughs> as i get older but yeah, as a, sure. as a 25 year old who's still got like life ahead of him it's like it's a very interesting concept to me because i already have like a couple of regrets where i'm like oh man if i could turn back time but it's not a big deal yeah. right now because it's like well i have all right. the fucking time in the world um, right. ahead of me and I could just learn from those and laugh about it now. But, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, this, that, that concept of regret, the concept of regrets and wishing you could turn back time, but knowing that it's impossible, um, very interesting, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of an unspoken thing in that movie where they never outright say like, oh, if only we could turn back time. And, you know, they mm-hmm. they sort of seem to have made peace with, on one hand, made peace with the idea that they never met back up on that train platform. Um, but on another hand, the subtext there does seem, there seems to be this undercurrent of, you know, this subtext of, hey, would have been cool if we <laughs> stuck right. it out, you know, if we, if we were able right, to meet back right. up. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, so let's do this after my number one, we'll do honorable mentions then. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think my number one is, sir? Give me some guesses. <clears throat> okay. So my guess, my number one guess of what your number one is, is that your number one is, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless One. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Everybody listening, that's proof positive right there. Edward and I are, uh, we, we fucking know each other like the back of our hands. Yeah, you got mine. Um, like, got yeah. <laughs> we know each other, man. Um, oh, you know me, dog. So, yeah. So, it's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, oh, boy. I don't even know where to begin with this one. So, I guess I'll just begin with the, the premise. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's it's starring Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet. Um, I am still to this day in love with Kate Winslet after this movie. Like every time I see her in anything, it's a, not <laughs> e- not even a, yeah, not even after like uh, not not even in like a um a, a crush kind of way, but just in a in, in like an appreciation for her as an actress kind of mm. way. Where like I just anytime I see her face in a movie, I I just am filled with like this kind of comfort and like. Just this sort of like, you know, oh, I, it just remi- reminding me of one of my favorite movies of all time, not just romantic film, but pretty much, I mean, this is probably in my like top five or top 10. It's 100% of my top 10. Um, mm-hmm. It probably is in my top five uh, as well. But because, um, you know, on Letterboxd, you can only do the four. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, you I, can only I think do it's the four. Eternal Sunshine is probably number five. But um, mm. But yeah, what do you have up there. Um, on my letterbox, I have um, Clerks, Hellraiser, Funny Games, and District Nine. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But um, so Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. For those who aren't familiar, um, it's direct, and it was directed by uh, is that Michelle Gondry Michelle Gondry okay I didn't know if it was Michael or Michelle Michelle Gondry I knew it was a woman who who directed it um it is right no it is a man it's a man oh it is a man (laughs) yeah he's a French he's a French he's a Frenchman that's right yeah okay yeah yeah, they do have that they do spell it like that okay um or they do have yeah guys named Michelle anyway uh, I what I could have told you is that it's written by Charlie Kaufman but I always forgot the director who the director was uh okay and uh, basically, the plot is after a painful breakup, Clementine, played by Kate Winslet, undergoes a procedure to erase memories of her former boyfriend, mm. Joel, from her mind. When Joel, that's Jim Carrey, when Joel discovers that Clementine is going to extremes to forget the relationship, he undergoes the same procedure and slowly begins to forget the woman that he loved. Directed by former music video director Michael Gun- uh, Michelle Gondry, the 
visually arresting film explores the intricacy of relationships and the pain of loss. So, so yeah, really interesting concept. Um, obviously there's some sci-fi. Remember when I mentioned, um, um, comedians that I grew up loving. I, I didn't mention Jim Carrey because I knew that this was going to be your number one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny, man. Yeah, yeah. That was some good, that's some solid foresight right there, man. Yeah, dude. Um, but yeah, obviously there's a little bit of sci fi uh, in there. I don't, you know, people co- consider this movie like a sci fi film. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. The sci fi is very much like in the background. I think it, it's more of, that's just a vehicle. Um, it really is just kind of an absurd, more of an absurdist film to me. I really don't look at this as a sci-fi film because um, science fiction to me is like about more about the technology and the implications of it, you know, mm-hmm. whereas, you know, like I think the movie Her, which I'm really surprised that wasn't in your top five, but we could we could talk I about know, that I in know. the honorable mentions <laughs> just so we don't throw people off with so many tangents. But. Like the movie Her, I think, and and feel free to bring this up afterward, Mm -hmm. but I think Her is more of a sci-fi film, even though I think, again, Her is more of a romance film than it is a sci-fi film. I would also say the sci-fi stuff is a little more in, well, a lot more in the forefront because he's literally talking to a computer the whole movie and it's more Mm -hmm. about that sort of AI um, idea again, still more of a romance film, but I really don't see eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. There's no focus on the actual mechanism of the memory erasing or of the machine that does Mm it. I mean, it literally looks like, (laughs) dude, it looks like they hook them up to a, a a 2001, a a Dell computer. I mean, it doesn't, it looks, it's like someone grabbed a, an old printer and an old monitor and just, we're like, okay, now well, let's put some wires on them. Like they give no thought to that at all. Um, but yeah, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I mean, it, it's one of those movies. It's as the description mentioned, it's one of those movies that explores uh, the pain of loss um, quite a bit. And it's sort of, you know, it's like, what if it, it's a great thought experiment. It's like, what if, you know, it, this was so painful what what if you could erase it from your memory you know the pain of the loss of whatever it was a breakup um in in the movie there's a scene where you know Joel is going to get the procedure done and he's sitting in a lobby and he sees a woman an old woman sitting in the lobby and she's got a box filled with like her dog's old things and mm. and that part always really hit me cuz it was like fuck man it's like it really does make you think cuz it's like on one hand, you're like, well, you don't want to forget about your dog. But on another hand, it's like sometimes that pain is so is like so much, you know, um, and it's so it's so interesting. And I think what what you realize during the film, though, and, and I think what the film is kind of trying to say is that it's really not worth it letting go of these memories, because part of the way right. through the character, this conflict sort of becomes like, oh, no, 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 I don't you know, he's sort of in his mind in sort of this, um, mind, uh, mindscape. And it's, it's like, Hey, I, you know, he, he, he gets to a point where he's doesn't want to let go. You know, he's like, I mm-hmm. want to keep these memories. I don't want to lose her after all. You know, I like remembering her. Um, and there's sort of an implication at the end though, that, that I don't want to spoil for people, but it's sort of, makes you think about the other side. So there's a great philosophical conflict in there mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. like, what's better, you know, is it, it, it it's again, it's that aid. It, it's sort of the age old idea of it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved it at all. And this movie right. poses the question, right. is that true? You know, mm-hmm. and that's sort of what this movie is about uh, to me. And this is a movie that just, I mean, there's like a certain scene um, for those who have seen this movie, uh, the scene is the the meet me in Montauk scene um, that really just puts like a lump in my throat and really tests my will to not cry like during a movie. <laughs> I, I mean, it really does. Um, and I'm yeah. not someone who cries at, at movies. You know, I'm, <laughs> I've never have. In fact, big man. No. Yeah, big no. Man. no, I'm just not. I mean, I, I you know, mm-hmm. it's hard mm-hmm. and and uh, mm-hmm. it's hard to get. I think it's hard to get anybody really to the point of tears 
uh, yeah. in, a, in a story, but um, this movie, you know, it gets me, it gets me there. Um, and that's all I really want to say. I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, yeah. Again, a fantastic examination of of love. Again, that honeymoon phase kind of beautifully shot film. Yeah, beautifully shot. I mean, incredibly uh, well acted. I mean, Jim Carrey. It's Jim Carrey, right? But it, yeah. in a dramatic role, and and it's mm -hmm. he, he knocks it out of the park. And yeah, that's that's my number one. Anything you want to say about this movie? I'm surprised this didn't make your, make it at any point on your list. I mean, I think no, I, would this have made a top ten? Do you think? No, dude, this would have made like on like this is the thing. If I was going simply off of ratings, I, this is a ten out of ten film on my on my yeah. letterbox. If, the, if I was just going out of ratings, this would have been like a top. This would have been in the top five. But I kind of just broke it down to like the you know romantic movies that I love in specific kind of like yeah. subgenres of things. Um, but no, dude, absolutely, you know. And but a big reason also why this didn't make it, you know, was because I knew that you were gonna have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Man. I was like, I know you're gonna have it. Yeah, so I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna put it in there. Like, punch drunk love was a question mark. Like, I knew, you know, I knew you were not gonna have like, you know, sense of sensibility or like only lovers just alive because I know you haven't seen that movie or whispers of whisper of the heart. I know you, were, I know you weren't gonna have those movies because you haven't seen them. Yeah. But I, I. Punch and Club was a, was a gamble. I was like, he might have Punch and Club in there. We had the um, same slot, too. That was perfect. Yeah, number four. Kind of worked for, out that way. But then for um, for for this movie, I knew you were going to have this movie, you know. So I didn't want to add it. Um, you you basically said everything I would have said. Incredible performance from Jim Carrey. Um, beautiful cinematography. Great direction. Incredible screenplay. I mean, Charlotte Kaufman won the only time in his career he's ever won best screenplay, I believe it was for this film. He might have won it again for, um, what's the name of that movie? The other movie. Not John Malkovich. Adaptation. adaptation. I think he might have won it for adaptation. Yeah. I'm overdue but on seeing the first adaptation. Time. I got to see adaptation. Adaptation is great. But, um, but I think this is the first time I think he won it, if not the second time, I'm not sure. But incredible film. Um, heartbreaking, like you said. It just kind of asks that question, you know, of like, you know, do you really want to forget these things? And the answer is no, you know. Um, and and it's one of those movies that I like. I start whenever I start watching this movie, and I got like five minutes into this movie, and I stopped watching it because I was like, this movie's too good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that ha that happens to me where I, sometimes I feel like I'm like, oh, this is too good, you know. Yeah, it's like, like you got to be in the right mindset for it. You don't want to yeah. squander it because like it's just the mood's not right or something. Is yeah, that, is, no, that I get over, what, yeah. is that kind of what it was? Yeah, that's, that's more or less what it is. Yeah, but also I get overwhelmed with movies. When the movies start saying, well, movies are like too good, I get overwhelmed. <laughs> and oh, okay. I go like, oh, Jesus, I'm overwhelmed, you know? Wow. Um, okay. But, but no, this is, this is, um, incredible movie. Yeah. So. And there, there's yeah. like so much that I want to say with regards to the ending. I, I could go on, but I just don't want to spoil it. I, it's not fair. I don't yeah. think to our, our audience. I think this is, it's better to just have mostly a spoiler free uh, listening experience for everybody. Um, other yeah, than, yeah. you know, again, we'll have spoiler tags guys. We try, we really, um, I think, I think we've done a good job of that, of adding spoiler tags in, in certain spots um, on, in the timestamps, but Darth yeah. Vader is looks father. Yeah. <laughs> Holy <laughs> dude. <laughs> oh, what, don't, what, what the fuck? I was just going to watch empire tonight, man. <laughs> Ruined it. No. Um, but yeah, like like I said, there's so much I could say about that ending that it, again, the ending just throws you for a loop where you question everything you've just witnessed because you think you know what the movie was trying to say and then you fucking um, are like, holy shit, oh my God, that's what it was actually trying to say the whole time. Um, yeah. There's so much I want to say, but again, I, I'm not going to spoil it. Um, you and I can talk about it on our own time, I guess. But yeah. Um, but yeah, let's do honorable mentions, man. What do you got for yours? Okay. I will do, I'm not going to go into detail with the honorable mentions, but yeah, I won't either. Um, for honorable mentions, we've, I have we've done her. enough for these people. <laughs> we've yeah. done enough for our listeners. <laughs> so we really have her. listeners. We, we, we really fed you guys an hour and 15 minutes of, of <laughs> yeah. recommendations. Um, yeah, that's enough. but, but her obviously didn't make the cut just because I, I wanted to kind of focus really just ultimately on movies that had like more of a romantic focus, I feel like with her, her gets a little bit too, too down and out, you know, and and mm -hmm. and, and 
you know, so I, was like, I excluded Mr. Joaquin, but that that was a honorable mention for me. Um, from from Mr. Ang Lee himself, I left out a movie called Lost Caution that he did in 2007 that that really is a kind of just about people. It's almost like a Romeo and Juliet movie where it's like this guy who's a bad guy and this girl who's in the opposite side of things. Um, great movie. Um, Brokeback Mountain is a great movie. Yes. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Moonrise Kingdom, the Wes Anderson movie from 2013, I left that out. Um, a movie called The Age of Innocence, um, directed by by Mr. Scorsese, 93, starring, um, what's his face again? Um, Daniel Day Lewis. I left that out. Um, but th- those are honorable mentions for me. Obviously, Before Midnight, Before Sunrise. Uh, let me see. Um, Lost in Translation, the Sofia Coppola movie, also an honorable mention. Call Me By Your Name, If Bill Street Could Talk. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, also, um, Terrence Malick, his movie Days of Heaven. Mm. Um, yeah. Did you say Phantom those, Thread? That's also in there. Yeah, those didn't make the cut. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised, man. I'm surprised Phantom Thread didn't make your cut. Yeah, I, mean, I left it out this time. I'm super yeah. fucking surprised at that. Damn, man. You expect that to be somewhere, huh? Oh, man. Yeah. And her used to be like your favorite movie pretty much, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, Our honestly. First year yeah. Of, of college, yeah. it was. Yeah. And yeah, then it was The so. Master, and then it was Phantom the Thread, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So PTA 100%. kept competing with of, himself of, for your top spot. Yeah, of, yeah, for my top spot of, of live action films. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, some honorable mentions. I'm I'm gonna rattle these off pretty quick, but yeah, um before uh sunrise, before sunset, um, Phantom Thread, uh Groundhog Day, The Graduate, uh Sing Street, I would put in there. Uh Woody Allen's Manhattan. Sing Street's pretty good. Yeah, Manhattan's pretty good. Yeah, I left yeah. Manhattan out for obviously. For obvious <laughs> yeah, reasons. true, true. True. Yeah. It's never easy, is it? Um <laughs> <laughs> as good as it gets with Jack Nicholson, I really like. Um, That's a great movie. Her uh, rom com, Ten Things I Hate About You, I think is a great. Rom-com. That's a great movie. Yeah, That's a Heath great rom com. Great movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Brokeback Mountain. Um, let me see here. About time, which I mentioned, or almost made the list. Uh, mm-hmm. The Virgin Suicides, which. That's listed as a romantic film here, but I'll, which I don't, I wouldn't have jumped, I wouldn't have thrown that in if, if I wouldn't, mm, yeah, I don't remember much from that, but I, I liked it. I, I, I really liked yeah. that movie. Um, yeah. Let me see, Pretty Woman, uh, The Apartment. I saw that for the first time. That's a great. I haven't seen The Apartment. Yeah, that's a great like Christmas. When Harry Met Sally. Yep, that's a good one. Uh, the holiday, yeah, I think the holiday is fantastic. That's a, that's got like a mixed reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. The holiday's great with Kate Winslet and uh, Cameron Diaz. That's a great. I'm not, movie. I'm not much of a fan of that movie. Really? Yeah. Wow. I think I give them like a five or a six. I'm not a big fan of that. Movie. Really, man. Wow, dude. Yeah. I think I think the holiday's fantastic. I've seen that a yeah, number of right. times too. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then another rom com I really like the setup, uh, with. Zoe Dooch, Dooch, and uh, Glenn mm-hmm. Powell. That's a that's mm-hmm. a really underrated uh, rom com. That one. Have you seen that one? I I couldn't get through that movie. I watched like ten minutes. <laughs> I gave up. <laughs> Fucking Grinch over here, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. The Mood for Love didn't make my my list. Shyly too. That's a great movie. One Car Why. Oh, okay. Okay. I haven't seen that one. And I think that's. Yeah, that might be it. Oh, Serendipity. I love that movie. That's a good one. I know you like that movie. John I should Cusack. check that movie out. Oh, you yeah. haven't seen Serendipity? Mm-mm. Okay. Okay, for some reason I thought you had. Yeah, that one's like, um, again, it, it's kind of a silly rom-com. It's a little, it's sillier though than like uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. Like there, there's, but I think there's a lot, I think that movie actually has a lot of merit. Um, mm mm-hmm. That, you know, and that that that's like that one grew on me. Like the, there's there's a lot of like um, uh, growers in this one, so to speak, in this list I, I found where like Punch Drunk Love. I I thought when I first saw that I was like, eh, it's like a seven or six maybe. And each time I think I've seen that one like 
three times maybe, and each mm-hmm. time I loved it better. Like the third time I watched it, yeah, I was to like, me that's oh my like god, ten. this that's is like a, yeah. I have that as like a nine out of a ten. That every time I watch the movie, I like it more. Yeah, I have that as a nine as well. Where like the mm-hmm. first time I saw, I think I've seen it again three times. First time I saw it, it's like eh, six or seven. Second time I saw it, I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Like there, there was mm-hmm. some things I actually think are really good in that. And then the third time I was like, this is fucking fantastic. <laughs> like, yeah. um. Yeah, I think that'll I think that'll do it. Oh, and uh, dude, oh uh, man, I forgot to do this. I was gonna pull a pull a fast one for number one. I was gonna say Twilight. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> you were trying to pull something. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna do a fake out there, but anyway, I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah, no. Um, but yeah, that's the show, everybody. Uh, we hope you had a good Valentine's Day. Thanks um, for joining us. Oh, what what do you got for next week, man? Next week, we're switching things all the way up. We're going into sci-fi horror territory. All right. I want us to watch the 2021 movie, Titan. Titan? What's this? Directed by Julia Docomarno. She's the same director that made Raw from 2016. Oh, shit. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's where we're going, dude. It's March. It's Oscar season. Let's watch an Oscar content. Titan. Okay. Oh, you know what? I have seen. I've seen this poster. Okay. Yeah. 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 I am all. Apparently, it's a very down. unsettling movie. So, so you yeah. know, eat something that you don't want to throw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm. I'm a hundred percent down, man. Let's do it. But yeah, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I uh, really hope you guys had a fantastic Valentine's Day. Whether you're single, whether you're in a relationship. Um, we hope you, you know, had a great uh, week and we hope you have a fantastic end to your, your February as we get into the springtime here. That's right, everybody. Have a great one. See you guys. Next time on Film Tangents, we're out.